chapter nineteen of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter nineteen the jury lawyer it is conceded by all his contemporaries that lincoln was the best all-round jury lawyer of his day in illinois undoubtedly his knowledge of human nature played an important part in his success he possessed another quality however which is almost if not quite as essential in jury work and that is clearness and simplicity of statement it will be remembered that in his sangamon river argument his first boyish attempt at pleading a case he had displayed unusual ability in presenting his facts and with age and experience he developed a perfect genius for statement his logical mind marshalled facts in such orderly sequence and he interpreted them in such simple language that a child could follow him through the most complicated cause and his mere recital of the issues had the force of argument many people suppose that there is only one way of telling the truth and that given honesty no art is required to make a frank and fair statement of matters in dispute but this is a popular delusion a truth which is badly put says mr wells in his mankind in the making is not a truth but an infertile hybrid lie and every lawyer of experience knows that not one man in a thousand can make facts speak for themselves certainly the average practitioner does not master his material he is controlled by it and presents his cause in such a manner as to necessitate contradiction invite confusion or challenge belief he has neither the confidence nor the skill to state the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth and his omissions and perversions naturally reflect on his honesty or sincerity lincoln on the contrary relied on truth knew how to tell it and with perfect sincerity often deceived the deceitful a stranger going into a court when he was trying a case says mr arnold one of his constant associates would after a few minutes find himself instinctively on lincoln's side and wishing him success this lucidity of expression persuasive clarity and convincing simplicity is of course the distinctive mark of lincoln's literary style in so far as his writing can be said to have a style and of this habit nurtured and matured in the court-room came some of the ablest state papers ever drawn by an american and some of the acknowledged masterpieces of english prose lincoln not only spoke a language which jurors could understand but he also took them into his confidence and made them feel as one of his contemporaries says that he and they were trying the case together he was likewise continually the friend of the court who thought it would be only fair to let in this or only right that that should be conceded and who reckoned he must be wrong when the court overruled him but who nevertheless took a quiet and tactful exception whenever the occasion required it now about the time he had practised through three-quarters of the case in this way observes leonard Sweat, his adversary would wake up to find himself beaten he was as wise as a serpent in the trial of a case and what he so blandly gave away was only what he couldn't get and keep of course these comments were merely intended to emphasize the fact that lincoln did not try both sides of his cases as some of his 
eulogists would have us believe but unfortunately they have been distorted into an implication that he indulged in tricks of the trade and that his apparent fairness was nothing better than a device by which he lured the unwary to destruction mr e m prince who is now living in bloomington illinois and who heard lincoln try over a hundred cases of all sorts is a competent authority on any question of this kind and his testimony is direct and convincing the truth is mr prince remarked while talking with the writer that mr lincoln had a genius for seeing the real point in a case at once and aiming steadily at it from the beginning of a trial to the end the issue in most cases lies in very narrow compass and the really great lawyer disregards everything not directly tending to that issue the mediocre advocate is apt to miss the crucial point in his case and is easily diverted with minor matters and when his eyes are opened he is usually angry and always surprised mr lincoln instinctively saw the kernel of every case at the outset never lost sight of it and never let it escape the jury that was the only trick i ever saw him play but the best possible proof that mr lincoln was an unusually fair practitioner and generous opponent is the fact that he made no enemies in the ranks of his profession during all his active and varied career forbearance is often mistaken for timidity and tact for weakness and it not infrequently happened that lincoln's professional opponents misinterpreted his attitude toward them but they were always speedily disillusioned mr sweat remarked that any one who took lincoln for a simple-minded man in the court-room would very soon wake up on his back in a ditch and although he seldom resorted to tongue-lashing and rarely displayed anger there is abundant evidence that no one ever attacked him with impunity judge weldon told the writer that on one occasion a lawyer challenged a juror because of his personal acquaintance with mr lincoln who appeared for the other side such an objection was regarded as more or less a reflection upon the honor of an attorney in those days and judge davis who was presiding at the time promptly overruled the challenge but when lincoln rose to examine the jury he gravely followed his adversary's lead and began to ask the talesmen whether they were acquainted with his opponent after two or three had answered in the affirmative however his honor interfered now mr lincoln he observed severely you are wasting time the mere fact that a juror knows your opponent does not disqualify him no your honor responded lincoln dryly but i am afraid some of the gentlemen may not know him which would place me at a disadvantage a successful jury lawyer must needs be something of an actor at times and during his apprentice years lincoln displayed no little histrionic ability in his passionate appeals to the juries indeed his notes in the right case show that he occasionally reverted to his principles even after he had reached the age of discretion this case was brought on behalf of the widow of a revolutionary war soldier whose pension had been cut in two by a rapacious agent who appropriated half of the sum collected for his alleged services the facts aroused lincoln's indignation and his memorandum for summing up to the jury ran as follows no contract not professional services unreasonable charge money retained by defendant not given by plaintiff revolutionary war describe valley forge privations ice soldiers bleeding feet plaintiff's husband soldier leaving home for army skin defendant close mr herndon who quotes this memorandum testifies that the soldiers bleeding feet and other pathetic properties were handled very effectively and that the defendant was skinned to the entire satisfaction of the jury it was only occasionally however that lincoln indulged in fervid oratory and his advice to herndon shows his belief in simplicity and reserve don't shoot too high herndon reports him as saying aim lower and the common people will understand you they are the ones you want to reach at least they are the ones you ought to reach the educated and refined people will understand you anyway 
if you aim too high your ideas will go over the heads of the masses and only hit those who need no hitting to interest the jurors and make them understand is of course the chief endeavor of every jury advocate and lincoln constantly employed his great gifts as a story-teller to illustrate simplify and reinforce his arguments which is another proof that he did not waste this valuable ammunition on tavern loiterers stories are more interesting than logic and far more effective with the average audience and lincoln's juries usually heard something from him in the way of an apt comparison or illustration which impressed his point upon their minds on one occasion when he was defending a case of assault and battery it was proved that the plaintiff had been the aggressor but the opposing counsel argued that the defendant might have protected himself without inflicting injuries on his assailant that reminds me of the man who was attacked by a farmer's dog which he killed with a pitchfork commented lincoln what made you kill my dog demanded the farmer what made him try to bite me retorted the offender but why didn't you go at him with the other end of your pitchfork persisted the farmer well why didn't he come at me with his other end was the retort lincoln not only made effective use of stories with the jury but frequently employed them in arguing to the court and he once completely refuted a contention that custom makes law with an anecdote drawn from his own experience old squire bagley from menard he began once came into my office and said lincoln i want your advice as a lawyer has a man what's been elected a justice of the peace a right to issue a marriage license i told him he had not lincoln i thought you was a lawyer he retorted bob thomas and me had a bet on this thing and we agreed to let you decide it but if that is your opinion i don't want it for i know a thunderin sight better i've been squire now eight years and i've done it all the time even the attorney whose argument for custom was thus answered must have smiled at this good-natured disposal of his claims and lincoln's humor generally freed his criticisms of all offence he can compress the most words into the smallest ideas of any man i ever met was perhaps the severest retort he ever uttered but history has considerably sheltered the identity of the victim wit and ridicule were lincoln's weapons of offence and defence and he probably laughed more jury cases out of court than any other man who practised at the bar i once heard mr lincoln defend a man in bloomington against a charge of passing counterfeit money vice-president stevenson told the writer there was a pretty clear case against the accused but when the chief witness for the people took the stand he stated that his name was j parker green and lincoln reverted to this the moment he rose to cross-examine why j parker green what did the j stand for john well why didn't the witness call himself john p green that was his name wasn't it well what was the reason he did not wish to be known by his right name did j parker green have anything to conceal and if not why did j parker green part his name in that way and so on of course the whole examination was farcical mr stevenson continued but there was something irresistibly funny in the varying tones and inflections of mr lincoln's voice as he rang the changes upon the man's name and at the recess the very boys in the street took it up as a slogan and shouted j parker green all over the town moreover there was something in lincoln's way of intoning his questions which made me suspicious of the witness and to this day i have never been able to rid my mind of the absurd impression that there was something not quite right about j parker green it was all nonsense of course but the jury must have been affected as i was for green was discredited and the defendant went free End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter twenty the cross examiner there were no official shorthand writers in the courts while lincoln practised and the lawyers took their own notes of the testimony during the trial and these 
together with such memoranda as the judge entered on his minutes formed the data for the record lincoln himself however rarely took any notes claiming that it distracted his attention and as his memory was excellent and his reputation for honesty well established he experienced no difficulty in supporting his version of what happened at the trial when the records were necessary for the appellate courts none of the bar ever attempted however to secure a verbatim report of the questions and answers and therefore it is impossible to obtain any official illustrations of lincoln's methods of handling witnesses there is abundant proof nevertheless of his skill in this particular and it is conceded by all his contemporaries that as a cross-examiner he had no equal at the bar in the trial of a case he moved cautiously said judge weldon and never examined or cross-examined witnesses to the detriment of his own side if the witness told the truth he was safe from his attacks but woe betide the unlucky or dishonest individual who suppressed the truth or colored it another of his associates testifies that he would not tolerate the evasions of his own witnesses when they were being questioned by his opponents and more than once he openly reproved his own clients for dodging and sulking in the witness chair he was a great cross-examiner mr james ewing remarked to the writer in that he never asked an unnecessary question he knew when and where to stop with a witness and when a man has learned that he is entitled to take rank as an expert questioner i shall never forget my experience with him observed mr james hoblet of logan county illinois one of the few men now living who ever faced him in the witness chair i was subpoenaed in a case brought by one paulin against my uncle and i knew too much about the matter in dispute for my uncle's good the case was not of vital importance but it seemed very serious to me for i was a mere boy at the time mr paulin had owned a bull which was continually raiding his neighbor's corn and one day my uncle ordered his boys to drive the animal out of his fields and not to use it too gently either well the boys obeyed the orders only too literally for one of them harpooned the bull with a pitchfork injuring it permanently and i saw enough of the occurrence to make me a dangerous witness the result was that paul ensued my uncle the boys were indicted for malicious mischief mr lincoln was retained by the plaintiff who was determined to make an example of somebody and i was subpoenaed as a witness my testimony was of course of the highest possible importance because the plaintiff couldn't make my cousins testify and i had every reason to want to forget what i had seen and though pretty frightened i determined when i took the stand to say as little as possible well as soon as i told mr lincoln my full name he became very much interested asking me if i wasn't some relative of his old friend john hoblet who kept the halfway house between springfield and bloomington and when i answered that he was my grandfather mr lincoln grew very friendly plying me with all sorts of questions about family matters which put me completely at my ease and before i knew what was happening i had forgotten to be hostile and he had the whole story after the trial he met me outside the courtroom and stopped to tell me that he knew i hadn't wanted to say anything against my people but that though he sympathized with me i had acted rightly and no one could criticize me for what i had done the whole matter was afterward adjusted but i never forgot his friendly and encouraging words at a time when i needed sympathy and consolation cross-examination makes greater demands upon a lawyer than any other phase of trial work and it has rightly been termed an art to succeed in it the practitioner must be versed in the rules of evidence he must be familiar with all the facts in his case and keep them continually in his mind he must think logically be far-sighted tactful and a keen judge of human nature all these qualities lincoln possessed to an unusual degree and in addition he exerted a remarkable personal influence upon everyone with whom he came into contact men who were openly opposed to him became fascinated when they met him and few ever retained their hostility this result was effected without any seeming effort on his part and lincoln was singularly free from all the arts and graces natural or cultivated which are usually associated with personal charm he was direct simple and unaffectedly frank 
and the conclusion is irresistible that he was endowed with psychic qualities of extraordinary power nothing except this can properly explain his wonderful control of witnesses and juries and every experienced lawyer knows that strong individuality commanding presence and personal magnetism are essential factors in the equipment of all great cross-examiners more than one man has described the effect of lincoln's eyes by saying that they appeared to look directly through whatever he concentrated his gaze upon and it is well known that during his frequent fits of abstraction he became absolutely oblivious to the bustle and confusion of the courtroom and saw nothing of the scene before him but although there was something mysterious in lincoln's personality which played an important part in his success as a cross-examiner his mastery of the art was acquired in the only way it can be acquired and that is by constant daily practice in the courts he was a natural logician and by slow degrees he cultivated this gift until he could detect faulty reasoning no matter how skillfully it was disguised in almost every instance he saw the logical conclusion of an answer long before it dawned upon the witness and was thus able to lead him without appearing to do so it will be seen in another chapter how effectively he once employed this art mr arnold comparing douglas and lincoln says both were strong jury lawyers lincoln was on the whole the strongest we ever had in illinois both were distinguished for their ability in seizing and bringing out distinctly and clearly the real points in a case both were happy in the examination of witnesses but i think lincoln was the stronger of the two in cross-examination this is valuable testimony coming as it does from a professional associate of many years standing and a careful reading of the great debates demonstrates that lincoln was not only a more effective questioner but in every other way a better equipped lawyer than douglas indeed it was douglas's errors of law quite as much as his errors of statesmanship which cost him the presidency lincoln's skill as a cross-examiner effected some of his most dramatic triumphs and his cause celebre is undoubtedly the trial of william armstrong for the killing of james metzger where his talents in this particular saved the day for his client the story of this now famous case has often been recounted and its dramatic features have been skilfully utilized in at least one volume of fiction but the distortions wrought by many versions justify a complete retelling of the facts gathered directly from the records themselves and from an interview with judge lyman lacy who was associated with mr walker the defendant's attorney and is still living in mason county in the days when lincoln was working as a clerk in offutt's new salem store he had won the respect and admiration of the rough element in the community by flooring one jack armstrong the leader of the clary's groves boys in a wrestling match and the fallen champion instantly became his staunch friend and ally armstrong afterward married and lincoln who knew his wife could not resist her appeal when she sought him out during the great debate with douglas and begged him to come to the rescue of her son who was charged with murder and was on the point of being tried mr william walker a skilful lawyer had been retained for the defence but as the case against his client was exceedingly serious he was only too willing to have expert assistance and lincoln therefore laid aside his pressing political engagements and plunged at once into the trial of the case the defendant william armstrong popularly known as duff was a youth of bad habits and on august twenty ninth eighteen fifty seven while under the influence of liquor he had quarrelled with another young man by the name of metzger and had beaten him severely this occurred during the afternoon but when the quarrel was renewed late at night one norris joined in the fracas and between him and armstrong metzger received injuries which resulted in his death popular indignation against the accused was so violent in mason county that armstrong's lawyer moved for a change of venue claiming that his client could not receive a fair trial in the local court and the judge was apparently of the same opinion for he removed the case to beardstown the county seat of cass county meanwhile norris the other defendant was brought to trial before the home tribunal 
where it was clearly shown that he had assaulted the deceased with a cart rung but it was not demonstrated that his blows had caused death and the body showed other wounds not necessarily made by such a weapon under these circumstances the jury brought in a verdict of manslaughter and the defendant was sentenced to eight years imprisonment this was the situation when hannah armstrong appealed to lincoln but despite the gloomy outlook he took a hopeful view and reassured the anxious mother not only were the facts against his client but the illinois law of that day did not permit a defendant to testify in his own behalf so that armstrong was precluded from giving his own version of the story and denying the testimony of the accusing witnesses the assistant prosecuting attorney was mr j henry shaw and caleb j dilworth another able lawyer was associated with him but lincoln scored against them at the start by securing a jury of young men whose average age was not over twenty-five most of the witnesses were also young and these lincoln handled so skillfully on cross-examination that their testimony did not bear heavily against the accused almost all of them were from the neighborhood of new salem and whenever the examiner heard a familiar name he quickly took advantage of the opening to let the witness know that he was familiar with his home knew his family and wished to be his friend these tactics succeeded admirably and no very damaging testimony was elicited until a man by the name of allen took the stand this witness however swore that he actually saw the defendant strike the fatal blow with a slung-shot or some such weapon and lincoln pressing him closely forced him to locate the hour of the assault as about eleven at night and then demanded that he inform the jury how he had managed to see so clearly at that time of night by the moonlight answered the witness promptly well was there light enough to see everything that happened persisted the examiner the witness responded that the moon was about in the same place that the sun would be at ten o'clock in the morning and was almost full and the moment the words were out of his mouth the cross-examiner confronted him with a calendar showing that the moon which at its best was only slightly past its first quarter on august twenty ninth had afforded practically no light at eleven o'clock and that it had absolutely set at seven minutes after midnight this was the turning point in the case and from that moment lincoln carried everything before him securing an acquittal of the defendant after a powerful address to the jury there is a singular myth connected with this case to the effect that mr lincoln played a trick on the jurors by substituting an old calendar for the one for the year of the murder and virtually manufacturing the testimony which carried the day how such a rumor started no one can say but it goes far to prove the impossibility of ever successfully refuting a lie for though repeatedly exposed it still persists on the illinois circuit to-day the facts are of course that the calendar for august twenty ninth eighteen fifty seven shows the position of the moon precisely as lincoln claimed it and every one who understands anything of trial work knows that an important exhibit of that sort would be examined by the judge and the opposing lawyers as well as by the jury besides being marked for identification if submitted in evidence therefore lincoln would have been a fool as well as a disreputable trickster if he had resorted to the asinine practice outlined in this silly tale which practically disproves itself End of chapter twenty Chapter Twenty One of Lincoln the Lawyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lincoln the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. Chapter Twenty One Legal Ethics. Despite his success in the Armstrong and other capital cases, Lincoln was not well qualified for work of this character and he avoided the practice of criminal law as far as possible there has long been a tradition in the old eighth illinois circuit that he once defended a murderer who was convicted sentenced and hanged but as capital cases resulting in conviction are almost invariably appealed to the highest tribunal and as the supreme court reports do not record any murder case with which he was associated the rumor has been supposed to be without foundation 
there is however a paper in lincoln's handwriting on file in hancock county showing that he was associated with the defense of one william frame who was tried and convicted april twenty fifth eighteen thirty nine for the murder of a man named william needhammer and subsequently hanged may eighteenth of the same year and this is doubtless the hitherto unlocated cause of circuit memories although he did not seek criminal practice lincoln did nevertheless occasionally appear in homicide cases and his defense of peachy harrison grandson of his old political rival peter cartwright the circuit riding preacher though less dramatic than the armstrong case is perhaps one of the best illustrations of his remarkable power with a jury young harrison and a youth by the name of greek crafton quarrelled over a question of politics and a fight ensued in which crafton received a knife thrust resulting in his death the case attracted considerable attention and both the prosecution and the defense were ably represented major general john m palmer afterward governor of illinois and john a mcclernand who also became a distinguished general in the civil war appearing for the people and lincoln herndon judge logan and shelby m cullum the present united states senator and ex-governor of illinois being retained for the defendant there was some conflict of testimony over the facts leading up to the killing but the defense did not make much impression until lincoln put the defendant's grandfather peter cartwright on the stand and with touching solicitude drew from the old man the story of his last interview with the deceased in which he expressed his reconciliation with his assailant whom he prayed would not be held responsible for his death then with virtually no facts to support his plea lincoln began his address to the jury exhorting them to heed the dying victim's words and abstain from visiting further sorrow and affliction upon the venerable preacher who had delivered them a message almost from the other world and so powerfully did he move his auditors that the efforts of the prosecution were unavailing and a verdict of acquittal followed lincoln was not considered a formidable opponent in the criminal courts however unless he thoroughly believed in the justice of his cause mr whitney reports that on one occasion when he was defending a man charged with manslaughter the testimony demonstrated that his client ought to have been indicted for murder in the first degree whereupon lincoln instantly lost all interest in the case he did not actually abandon the defence but he could not cooperate effectively with his associates who were endeavouring to acquit the defendant and one of them states that when lincoln addressed the jurors he disparaged the effort which had been made to work upon their feelings and confined himself to a strictly professional argument along conventional lines with the result that the defendant was found guilty and sentenced to three years imprisonment this fairly disgusted mr whitney who was anxious to have the murderer acquitted and he does not hesitate to characterize mr lincoln's conduct as atrocious but lincoln was guilty of many other atrocities of the same character it is well known that he virtually abandoned his client in another capital case when he discovered that he was defending a guilty man you speak to the jury he said to leonard sweat his associate counsel if i say a word they will see from my face that the man is guilty and convict him on another occasion when it developed that his client had indulged in fraudulent practices he walked out of the courtroom and refused to continue the case the judge sent a messenger directing him to return but he positively declined tell the judge that my hands are dirty and i've gone away to wash them was his disgusted response this conduct in the courtroom was in entire keeping with his office practice where he declined time and again to undertake doubtful causes discourage litigation and discountenance sharp practices yes mr herndon reports him as advising a client we can doubtless gain your case for you we can set a whole neighborhood at loggerheads we can distress a widowed mother and her six fatherless children and thereby get for you six hundred dollars to which you seem to have a legal claim but which rightfully belongs it appears to me as much to the woman and her children as it does to you you must remember however that some things legally right are not morally right we shall not take your case but we will give you a little advice for which we will charge you nothing you seem to be a sprightly energetic man we would advise you to try your hand at making six hundred dollars in some other way 
at another time he was very anxious to secure delay in a certain case and herndon drew up a dilatory plea which would effectively postpone the trial for at least one term of court it was the sort of thing which is condoned in almost every law office but lincoln repudiated it the moment it came to his notice is this founded on fact he demanded of his partner and herndon was obliged to admit that it was not urging however that it would save the interests of their client which would otherwise be imperiled but lincoln was not to be persuaded you know it is a sham he answered and a sham is very often but another name for a lie don't let it go on record the cursed thing may come staring us in the face long after this suit has been forgotten herndon complied with this instruction and the paper was withdrawn these and similar actions have been characterized by one highly respectable authority as admittedly detracting from lincoln's character as a lawyer but no member of the profession who has the best interests of his calling at heart will accept such a conclusion on the contrary it is because he had the courage and character to uphold the highest standards of the law in daily practice that lincoln is entitled to a place in the foremost rank of the profession he lived its ideals and showed them to be practical and his example gives inspiration and encouragement to thousands of practitioners who believe that those things which detract from the character of the man detract from the character of the lawyer some of lincoln's biographers apparently disregard his legal history because he never succeeded in making much more than a bare living from his practice and they seemingly conclude from this fact that he is not entitled to high rank in the profession this view of course misses one of the vital points in lincoln's character both as a man and a lawyer for he placed principle beyond price and illustrated the maxim that it is better to make a life than a living before he had won his place at the bar he had stated his theories on the subject the matter of fees is important far beyond the mere question of bread and butter involved he wrote in his notes for a law lecture properly attended to fuller justice is done to both lawyer and client an exorbitant fee should never be charged as a general rule never take your whole fee in advance nor any more than a small retainer when fully paid beforehand you are more than a common mortal if you can feel the same interest in the case as if something was still in prospect for you as well as for your client this was largely the advice of a theorist but lincoln carried it into practice so completely that the profession was scandalized indeed one of his associates relates an incident where lincoln's scruples proved exceedingly embarrassing he had been retained to oppose the removal of a conservator or legal guardian of a woman whose mind was deranged the estate involved about ten thousand dollars and the man who was attacking the conservator evidently desired to have him removed so that he could marry the lunatic and obtain possession of her funds lincoln made short work of this nefarious business but when he learned that the attorney who had retained him had charged two hundred and fifty dollars for their joint services he refused to take any share of the money until the fee had been reduced to what he deemed a reasonable amount when judge davis heard of this he was highly indignant lincoln you are impoverishing the bar by your picayune charges he is said to have exclaimed and the lawyers thereupon tried the offender by what was called on the circuit an orgmethagorical mock court but he stood trial and being found guilty paid the fine with the utmost good nature judge weldon describes another episode which perfectly illustrates lincoln's attitude toward more than one aspect of the law a portuguese by the name of dungi married a girl named spencer and later there was a family quarrel between the bridegroom and his relatives-in-law which became so bitter that the girl's brother referred to her husband as a nigger and followed this up by describing him as a nigger married to a white woman dungi thereupon retained lincoln and sued his brother-in-law for slander the defendant was represented by mr moore and judge weldon and when the case was moved for trial in clinton county judge weldon demurred to lincoln's complaint on technical grounds and the demurrer was sustained lincoln was not too pleased that his papers were rejected as faulty but he redrew them merely remarking to his opponents with significant determination now i will beat you 
when the case reappeared for a hearing he was as good as his word attacking the defendant with great severity for his scandalous utterances after a two days battle the jury decided for the plaintiff and the verdict amounted to what was a large sum in those days but although he had won the fight lincoln was not satisfied with the result as a peacemaker the lawyer has a superior opportunity of being a good man he had written as a theorist and in practice he was still able to see that money damages do not heal family feuds thereupon he persuaded his client not to insist upon the payment of the verdict and the matter was finally adjusted by the defendant agreeing to pay the costs and lawyers fees lincoln stipulated that his adversaries should fix the amount of his fee but when they declined to do so he remarked well gentlemen don't you think i have honestly earned twenty-five dollars certainly there are good grounds for criticizing lincoln as a business man and no one will dispute the charge that he was utterly lacking in all the essentials of commercial genius End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor chapter twenty two legal reputation one of lincoln's latest biographers in expressing admiration for his statesmanship enumerates his disadvantages and asserts that before he went to washington he had had no experience in diplomacy and statesmanship as an attorney he had dealt only with local and state statutes he had never argued a case in the supreme court and he had never studied international law there is very little inspiration in the career of a man whose achievements are inexplicable or whose natural endowments are the despair of ordinary mortals and eulogies which tend to rob lincoln of human interest and incentive are usually based on misinformation certainly the wondering tribute above quoted displays no convincing acquaintance with the facts for it entirely misrepresents the extent and value of lincoln's legal education his three-and-twenty years active practice in the courts supplied him with the best of diplomatic training it did not of course familiarize him with the etiquette and forms of international relations but it gave him a thorough knowledge of men and taught him to see behind the smiling mask of craft much the same experience qualified an ex-secretary of state to cope successfully with the most skilful diplomats of europe during the spanish war and to confer high distinction upon our modern statesmanship again lincoln's knowledge of law was not confined to local or state statutes he was acquainted with the great principles of the english common law and if he was not familiar with the waves and tides of legal authority he was still well grounded in all the fundamentals of his profession and it would be absurd to deny him recognition as a lawyer merely because he never had had a case in the united states supreme court but even in this small particular the biographer is at fault for lincoln did have a case before that tribunal known as lewis v lewis reported in seven howard seven seventy six and the original of his brief in that action is in existence to-day it would not be difficult to quote passages from other biographers in proof of the fact that lincoln's work as a lawyer has never been scrutinized with any care and doubtless the trivial anecdotes concerning his life on the circuit which have done duty for the last forty-five years have contributed to the general misconception of his professional standing the once funny story about the pig and crooked fence case the old sledge and seven up trial and similar time-worn yarns have been accepted as characterizing his legal experience and under such circumstances it is not at all surprising that serious historians have regarded his legal training as a negligible quantity fortunately however the records are accessible and they speak very largely for themselves in his twenty-three years at the bar lincoln had no less than one hundred and seventy-two cases before the highest court of illinois a record unsurpassed by his contemporaries he appeared before the united states circuit and district courts with great frequency he was the most indefatigable attendant on the eighth circuit and tried more cases than any other member of that bar he was attorney for the illinois central railroad 
the greatest corporation in the state and one which doubtless had its choice of legal talent he was also counsel for the rock island railroad and other corporations and individuals with important legal interests at stake he was sought as legal arbiter in the great corporation litigations of illinois and he tried some of the most notable cases recorded in the courts of that state perhaps the most important cause he ever handled was that known as the illinois central railroad v mclean county reported in seventeen illinois two ninety one this was an action brought against mclean county to restrain the collection of certain taxes alleged to be due from the railroad growing out of the fact that the illinois legislature had granted the corporation exemption from all state taxes on condition that it pay seven per cent of its gross earnings into the state treasury the county authorities however claimed that this provision did not preclude them from taxing so much of the railroad's property as lay within their respective jurisdictions and a great legal battle ensued the issue was a vital one for the corporation for the claims of the county threatened it with bankruptcy and railroading in illinois was then in its experimental stage lincoln conducted the defense with rare skill but lost in the first court he instantly appealed the case to the supreme court however and there it was twice argued before a final decision was recorded in favor of the road at the end of two years litigation this celebrated case was provocative of another for the illinois central declined to pay lincoln's bill for services rendered in the tax matter without suit and he brought an action in the supreme court for five thousand dollars in costs on the trial all the leaders of the illinois bar o h browning n b judd isaac arnold grant goodrich archibald williams judge norman purple judge logan and robert blackwell joined in a written statement which was presented to the court certifying that lincoln's bill was reasonable and the jury promptly brought in a verdict for the full amount it is interesting to note lincoln's attitude and conduct in this litigation when the case was first called for trial no one appeared on behalf of the railroad and judgment was awarded to the plaintiff by default nevertheless lincoln agreed that the case might be reopened thus allowing the defendant to have its day in court without penalty and when the verdict was rendered he agreed to have it set aside because he had forgotten to introduce proof of two hundred dollars which had been given him as a retainer and the final verdict was recorded at forty eight hundred dollars and costs incidentally it may be mentioned that the services for which lincoln was obliged to sue would today cost the corporation not five but fifty thousand dollars it is only fair to state that within the last few years the illinois central railroad has issued an elaborate pamphlet giving its side of this case and undertaking to show that lincoln's bill was not certified out of deference to the board of directors who might have censured the local officials for voluntarily paying so large a charge against their company and that the trial was merely a formality lincoln's unusually careful brief on the law and the facts however does not bear out the contention that the litigation was friendly and there are other facts which tend to indicate that the corporation's treatment of its distinguished counsel was not as handsome as the publication in which it now explains its action while lincoln was traveling the circuit with judge davis he was retained in the now famous case of mccormick v manny an action brought by the plaintiff who owned valuable patents for reaping machines to enjoin the defendant from manufacturing similar contrivances and to recover four hundred thousand dollars damages for infringements lincoln was engaged by a mr watson who was in charge of the defense and the original plan was to have him conduct the forensic part of the trial mr e h dickerson a well-known patent solicitor had been retained by mccormick to make the technical argument and reverdy johnson the noted baltimore advocate and one of the most distinguished lawyers in the country was to oppose lincoln who was naturally very anxious to measure himself against a man of such wide reputation but mr watson also saw fit to retain mr harding a patent solicitor and edwin m stanton who then resided at pittsburgh but who was well and favorably known in cincinnati where the trial was to take place and whose personal influence with the court was relied upon to offset the great reputation of reverdy johnson when the lawyers met in cincinnati it was decided in consultation that only two counsels should be heard on each side and that the defense should be represented by harding and stanton 
this was undoubtedly a bitter disappointment to lincoln who had carefully prepared himself to make the argument and who had never had an equal opportunity of meeting a lawyer of national reputation he accepted the decision as gracefully as possible however furnishing mr harding with all the notes and other material he had collected for the argument and had stanton treated him with consideration the situation would have been freed of all embarrassment but stanton was utterly devoid of tact and took no trouble to conceal his contempt for his illinois associate where did that long-armed creature come from and what does he expect to do in this case he inquired of the other lawyers and this and similarly offensive comments reached lincoln's ears discourtesy was absolutely foreign to his nature and it is no wonder that it embittered and disgusted him yet the greatness of the man enabled him to suppress his personal resentment and when the nation had need of stanton's undoubted talents lincoln laid aside his own feelings and tolerated his overbearing secretary until he conquered him with kindness lincoln was recognized as a good jury lawyer long before he won any reputation in other lines of legal work judge logan first noted his effectiveness in arguments addressed to the bench but despite his excellent record in the supreme court where he won a large majority of his cases he did not gain any marked recognition as a court lawyer until well into the fifties he was however eminently qualified for work of this character his power of analysis pitiless logic and comprehensive mental grasp of large subjects all combined to make him a formidable opponent in legal discussions and a powerful influence with the court he could split the ears of the groundlings when passionate appeals were in order but he was not naturally emotional on the contrary he was cool calm and temperate in word thought and action patent cases with their nice problems in mechanics and engineering interested him intensely and more than once he constructed models with his own hands to aid him in trying actions of this sort which demanded close reasoning and afforded him practical experience in exact scientific deductions he took no interest in the ordinary legal abstractions discussed in courtrooms and the quibbles of practice bored him but when there was any real principle involved in a question of law he studied it with the closest attention and his arguments were usually so original that they presented the subject in a new light no matter how often it had been discussed thus when the steamboats and the railroads were struggling for commercial supremacy in the mississippi valley and the right to bridge the river was in dispute new and vital questions of law arose which he handled in a masterful manner on behalf of the rock island railroad in one of these bridge cases which he tried in chicago a steamboat had struck a pier of the railroad's bridge and its owners brought a suit for damages involving propositions never before presented to the courts and requiring clear and original thought some idea of the bitterness of this contest may be gathered from the fact that the railroad charged the steamboat captain with being bribed to run his vessel against the bridge and thus make a case of obstructing navigation this accusation was of course angrily denied but when the bridge was accidentally burned all the river craft gathered at the spot and let their whistles loose in sheer joy at the disaster under these circumstances it required a cool head and an even temper to carry the day and lincoln was equal to the occasion his argument one of his few legal speeches which have been preserved was reported by the hon robert hitt and it demonstrates lincoln's conspicuous ability in presenting close questions of law and indicates his notable development as a lawyer another notable civil cause in which he was engaged was known as the sandbar case involving certain accretions to the shore of lake michigan of vast importance to the illinois central railroad and his discussion of the law on behalf of his client displayed high ability and resourcefulness much of lincoln's effectiveness in this class of work was due to his mental independence precedents did not make him overconfident and they never balked him back of the recorded education he sought the reason and if it did not satisfy his mind he would not accept it very few lawyers possess sufficient independence and originality for research of this character and the average brief though it often displays great ingenuity in reconciling divergent authorities rarely indicates any really creative thought legal argument calls for a higher order of ability than jury work 
and it developed lincoln's talents for logical reasoning until it perfected him to meet and refute the most ingenious debater of his or possibly of any other day end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill chapter twenty three law in the debate lincoln had been practicing on the eighth circuit for five years when the bill to repeal the missouri compromise was introduced in congress eighteen fifty four and during that time he had devoted himself exclusively to the duties of his profession it is not possible to obtain an accurate record of the number of cases he tried during those five years for his name was not always entered on the dockets when he acted as counsel for other lawyers but we know that he argued at least forty appeals in the supreme court within that period and the records of the various county seats and the testimony of his contemporaries go far to demonstrate that no other lawyer on the circuit and probably none in the state had anything like the number and variety of cases which he conducted between eighteen forty nine and eighteen fifty four it was during the last named year that the bill was introduced authorizing congress to organize kansas and nebraska as territories and to this bill an amendment was added repealing the missouri compromise act by which slavery was prohibited in the proposed new territories lincoln was attending court on the circuit when this news reached him and judge dickey one of his fellow practitioners who was sharing his room in the local tavern at the time reports that lincoln sat on the edge of his bed and discussed the political situation far into the night at last dickey fell asleep but when he awoke in the morning lincoln was sitting up in bed deeply absorbed in thought i tell you dicky he observed as though continuing the argument of the previous evening this nation cannot exist half slave and half free this is probably the first time lincoln ever used the phrase which was destined to become so famous in later years and shortly afterward he made his first direct answer to one of douglas's speeches supporting the missouri compromise repeal and the great duel of debate began to say that the general public was surprised by the force and effectiveness of lincoln's attack is to put the matter very mildly it was fairly astonished and the most amazed man in the community was probably judge douglas himself he had been absorbed with his duties in the united states senate for the past seven years and lincoln hard at work with court duties had virtually disappeared from his view he had known him as a local practitioner an effective stump speaker and country attorney but he was not prepared for the logical lawyer-like arraignment to which he found himself subjected and after two more encounters with this new antagonist he called a truce proposing that neither he nor lincoln should make any more speeches during the rest of the fall campaign to this lincoln assented returning to his law practice and thus ended the first skirmish of what was destined to be one of the most notable debates of history lincoln kept steadily at his court work until the fall of that year when he decided that to do effective service in the campaign against the extension of slavery he would have to re-enter politics and being nominated for the illinois assembly he made the necessary canvass and was elected by a great majority in november eighteen fifty four he had no sooner taken office however than he resigned to become a candidate for the united states senatorship but his selection was frustrated by a combination among the local politicians and lyman trumbull another member of the bar obtained a majority of the votes this was in february eighteen fifty five and lincoln immediately resumed his duties on the circuit during this and the following year he argued and won the mclean county case for the illinois central prepared and appeared in the mccormick reaper action argued no less than thirteen appeals in the court of last resort and otherwise spent the most active year and a half in his entire professional career under this daily training in the courts his immense latent powers steadily developed his mind expanded and his confidence increased and it was undoubtedly the leader of the illinois bar who addressed the convention at bloomington on may twenty ninth eighteen fifty six 
the speech which he delivered on that occasion was lost to the world because he held the audience so spellbound that even the reporters forgot their duties and neglected to take notes but those who heard it spread the tidings that a new champion had entered the political arena equipped to do battle with all comers but lincoln did not feel himself fully prepared and when the first republican convention was held at philadelphia a few weeks later the news that he had received one hundred and ten votes for vice-president reached him while he was engaged in trial work at urbana it can't be me they are voting for was his smiling comment there's another great man of the same name somewhere in massachusetts it's probably him important events followed in quick succession but lincoln stuck steadily to his court duties fremont and dayton were nominated by the republicans against buchanan and breckinridge but except for making a number of speeches for fremont in the fall lincoln's professional life went on uninterruptedly then buchanan was elected and shortly after his inauguration the supreme court announced its decision in the dred scott case which instead of smothering the fires of anti-slavery agitation added fuel to the flames which burst out in every part of the country meanwhile lincoln continued active in the courts gaining greater reputation with every term and rapidly rounding into shape from eighteen fifty six to eighteen fifty eight his name appears fifteen times in the illinois appellate reports and within the same period he tried the celebrated wyant murder case in bloomington his leadership of the bar was everywhere acknowledged and he was in the midst of the most active professional duties when he was nominated by the illinois republicans to succeed douglas whose term in the senate was just expiring as on other occasions when he stood confronted by opportunity the man responded to the power within him and he accepted the great task which lay before him with calmness and quiet confidence his opponent had the prestige of eleven years senatorial experience he was recognized as one of the best debaters in the upper house and acknowledged as a national leader of marvelous personal charm the ideal of his home constituents and the probable presidential candidate of the national democracy lincoln did not underestimate his abilities but he had taken his measure in their previous tilt and he did not hesitate to challenge him to debate the issues of the campaign mr lincoln is a very amiable gentleman was douglas's first reply but later he yielded to the pressure of his friends and accepted the challenge from the moment of collision it was evident that a great struggle was imminent and despite the applause and flattery of his supporters douglas must have known in his heart of hearts that he had at last met his match brilliant and resourceful as he was in popular appeal his dexterity with the weapons of debate was more than offset by lincoln's better knowledge of law and his greater familiarity with legal argument and the contest hinged largely upon the effect of the dred scott case as decided by the supreme court dred scott it will be remembered was a negro whose missouri master after a short residence in illinois had moved into what was then wisconsin territory now minnesota with the slave and after living there for a time had returned to missouri and sold him scott thereupon sued in a missouri court to establish his freedom claiming that his residence in the free state of illinois and the free territory of wisconsin had emancipated him the first local court sustained his contention but the decision was reversed on appeal he was then sold to a man in new york and began another suit in the federal courts of st louis which promptly ruled against him the case was then appealed to the united states supreme court at washington where the plaintiff was represented by montgomery blair and george tickner curtis and the defendant by reverdy johnson whom lincoln had hoped to meet in the mccormick case and after two elaborate hearings scott was declared a slave by a divided vote of the judges two of whom wrote dissenting opinions this decision of the highest tribunal in the country was expected to settle the slavery issue for it decreed protection to slave owners in the enjoyment of their property wherever situated as a constitutional right lincoln however promptly challenged the authority of any court to dispose of a great national issue such as the slavery question and early in the debate with douglas he forced the discussion of this subject to the fore in the field of argumentative statement mr webster at the time of his death had no rival in america says mr boutwell 
but he has left nothing more exact explicit and convincing than this extract from lincoln's first speech in the great debate if any man choose to enslave another no third man shall be allowed to object which embodies the substance of the opinion of the supreme court of the united states in the dred scott case douglas instantly responded by declaring that those who resisted the finding of the court were traitors fomenting revolution and intimated that his adversary's duty as a lawyer was to uphold the law and discountenance resistance to its decrees but lincoln's reply was so calm fair dignified and professionally correct that it not only put his accuser completely in the wrong but placed his opposition on a high and perfectly legal plane we believe as much as judge douglas perhaps more in obedience to and respect for the judicial department of the government he asserted but we think the dred scott decision is erroneous we know the court that made it has often overruled its own decisions and we shall do what we can to have it overrule this we offer no resistance to it if this important decision had been made by the unanimous concurrence of the judges and without any apparent partisan bias and in accordance with legal public expectation and the steady practice of the departments throughout our history and had been in no part based on assumed historical facts which are not really true or if wanting in some of these it had been before the court more than once and had there been affirmed and reaffirmed through a course of years it then might be perhaps would be factious nay even revolutionary not to acquiesce in it as a precedent but when as is true we find it wanting in all these claims to the public confidence it is not resistance it is not factious it is not even disrespectful to treat it as not having yet quite established a settled doctrine for the country if douglas had been permitted to choose his weapons he would doubtless have avoided all legal controversy with his trained opponent but the situation did not admit of silence and he was forced to discuss the meaning and effect of the supreme court's decision with a master of logic well versed in the maxims and principles of constitutional law the effect of this was speedily apparent at the outset of the campaign his victory over lincoln had seemed an absolute certainty but as time wore on the result began to be questioned and each meeting with his rival left the outcome in greater doubt finally he decided to carry the war into the enemy's country and in an evil moment he propounded a series of questions intended to confuse and embarrass his adversary had he remembered lincoln's searching interpolation of the polk administration in the spot resolutions he might have hesitated in his attempt to bait the ablest cross-examiner in the state but apparently he did not perceive the opening which he gave to his opponent i will answer these interrogatories announced lincoln when he received the seven questions intended to entrap him upon condition that he judge douglas will answer questions for me not exceeding the same number i give him an opportunity to respond no reply came from his adversary and the vast audience at freeport waited the outcome with a breathless interest which the keen jury lawyer instantly interpreted the judge remained silent continued lincoln impressively i now say i will answer his interrogatories whether he answers mine or not but after i have done so i shall propound mine to him another breathless pause greeted this resistless challenge and then the speaker began reading douglas's questions no lawyer who examines them can fail to see that they were so loosely worded as to admit of a negative answer in every instance rendering them utterly ineffective and lincoln disposed of them in this manner but having shown that he could in this way technically defeat his opponent's object he instantly waived the form of the questions and replied to them one after the other as fairly and frankly as any one could desire and having done so he propounded four counter-questions which proved to be the most fatal cross-examination or counter-questioning in history all the inquiries were adroit but it was the second which displayed lincoln as a master of interrogation can the people of the united states territory he asked in any lawful way 
against the wish of any citizen of the united states excludes slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution the answer to this question required douglas to interpret the dred scott decision if he replied in the negative the people of illinois would repudiate him because they would not countenance the idea that the mischief had been done and that slavery had already been forced upon the territories if on the other hand he answered that the territories were still free to choose or reject slavery he would have to explain away the dred scott decision which guaranteed protection to slave property in the territories as a constitutional right and this would displease the southern democracy which was then listening to his every word to determine whether he was or was not a safe presidential candidate the republican politicians of illinois were not so astute as douglas still they foresaw that he would give a plausible answer to the question which would satisfy the local voters and they begged lincoln to withdraw the inquiry but the far-sighted lawyer who framed it was deaf to their entreaties then you will never be senator was the angry warning of one of his advisers if douglas answers responded lincoln calmly he will never be president the fatal question was therefore left as lincoln had phrased it and at the first opportunity douglas answered it by stating that the territories were still free agents they could exclude slavery despite the dred scott decision he explained simply by adopting local police regulations so hostile to slavery that no slave owner could enjoy his property within their boundaries as soon as he had uttered it douglas must have seen that his answer involved a gross blunder in law but if he had any doubt on the matter lincoln speedily dispelled it how could the constitutional right of the peaceful enjoyment of slave property guaranteed in the dred scott case be cancelled by police or any other hostile legislation he demanded any such ordinance or law would be contrary to the constitution and absolutely void either judge douglas's answer or the doctrine of the supreme court was bad law for the one was inconsistent with the other but illogical as it was this fallacy caught the popular fancy and douglas seeing that it satisfied his constituents held to it and was elected to the senate nevertheless as lincoln anticipated his blunder in law cost him the presidency and not long afterward judah benjamin one of the most ardent and able representatives of the south arraigned him as a renegade and traitor we accuse him for this he thundered that having bargained with us upon a point upon which we were at issue that it should be considered a judicial point that he would abide the decision that he would not act under the decision and consider it a doctrine of the party that having said that to us here in the senate he went home and under the stress of a local election his knees gave way his whole person trembled his adversary stood upon principle and was beaten and lo he is the candidate of a mighty party for the presidency of the united states the senator from illinois faltered he got the prize for which he faltered but the grand prize of his ambition to-day slips from his grasp because of his faltering in his former contest and his success in the canvass for the senate purchased for an ignoble price has cost him the loss of the presidency of the united states thus two years after lincoln's question was put and answered douglas was repudiated by his southern friends the democratic party split three candidates instead of one were nominated against the republicans and the lawyer whose skill had precipitated this result was triumphantly elected at the polls end of chapter twenty three Chapter Twenty Four of Lincoln the Lawyer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Lincoln the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. As candidate, Lincoln had very little time for the practice of law during his campaign against Senator Douglas but he did not as is generally supposed wholly abandon his professional duties in the midst of the debates he tried the armstrong murder case his most celebrated cause 
and the moment the election was decided, he resumed his attendance on the circuit. It was while he was engaged in this work that his friend Jesse Fell, an Illinois politician, met him in the streets of Bloomington, and drawing him into a deserted law office, seriously suggested that he become a candidate for the presidential nomination. Mr. Fell had been traveling in the East during the great debates, and had been impressed by the repeated inquiries addressed to him concerning the personal history of the man who was making such a sturdy fight against the famous Illinois senator, and he had reached the conclusion that Lincoln was a presidential possibility. No other lawyer in the country had dissected the Dred Scott decision as he had dissected it, either from a legal or from a popular standpoint, and of the thousands who were discussing the slavery question, he was the only one whose arguments sounded fresh and convincing. But Lincoln was not then prepared to take Fell's suggestion seriously and he declined for the time being to furnish the sketch of his life which his friend requested, and it was not until some months later that he was persuaded to reconsider the matter. On February 27, 1860, he delivered the remarkable address at Cooper Union, New York, which was instantly recognized as the ablest discussion of the slavery issues ever undertaken by a public speaker, and his national reputation dates from that day. The speech which he delivered on that occasion was neither oratorical nor partisan. It was a calm, dispassionate, lawyer-like argument, keyed to the high intelligence of the audience to which it was addressed, and it exhibited Lincoln as a master of all the historical and legal data involved in the subject. No one but a fully equipped lawyer experienced in the handling of facts, and one trained to make their legal bearing clear to the layman by logical analysis, could possibly have held his critical hearers as Lincoln held them, and his triumph was the direct result of three and twenty years of service in the courts. After the Cooper Union address, Lincoln made a short speech-making tour in New England, but except for this work and two speeches in Ohio toward the close of the previous year, he was engaged as usual in his law practice, and 1859 was perhaps the busiest of his professional years. It was within those twelve months that he tried and won the famous Harrison murder case, and during the sessions of the Supreme Court he appeared in no less than ten appeals. For the first half of the succeeding year he was apparently equally mindful of his law business, and shortly before the Chicago Convention at which he was nominated, he argued one of his best-known cases, popularly termed the Sandbar case, in the United States Circuit Court. This, however, was the last case he tried. Two months later, the Eighth Circuit was well and ably represented at Chicago by Judge Davis Leonard Sweat, Judge Logan, John M. Palmer, Richard Oglesby, Mr. Herndon, Judge Weldon, and others. These men had gone to the convention determined to procure Lincoln's nomination, and they were well qualified for the work at hand. The lawyers of our circuit, wrote Leonard Sweat, went there determined to leave no stone unturned, and really they and some of our state officers and a half-dozen men from various portions of the state were the only tireless, sleepless, unwavering, and ever-vigilant friends he had. Circumstances aided this little group of lawyers, but they were alive to every opportunity, and as ex-Vice President Stevenson pointed out to the writer, it was Lincoln's acquaintance with certain of the Indiana delegates whom he had met while traveling the circuit counties bordering on that state, which proved the opening wedge. Pennsylvania was the next point of attack, but when Lincoln heard talk of a bargain being made with Simon Cameron's followers, he sent positive instructions that no promises should be made in his name and that he would be bound by none. His zealous friends did, however, enter into an agreement with the Pennsylvanians, which was destined to cause their principal much embarrassment at a later date, when he found himself virtually committed to appoint Simon Cameron to a cabinet position. When the moment for nominations arrived, it was N. B. Judd, one of the attorneys for the Rock Island Railroad, and Lincoln's constant legal associate, who placed his name before the convention, and when Caleb Smith, another lawyer, seconded it on behalf of Indiana, such a roar of approval burst from the Illinois delegation as was never before heard in any convention hall. 
lincoln has it by sound now let us ballot shouted judge logan as soon as he could make himself heard and on the third ballot the leader of the illinois bar and the idol of the eighth circuit was declared the choice of the convention it would perhaps be too much to claim that lincoln's strategic caution and masterly silence during the eventful months which followed were entirely due to his professional habit but it cannot be doubted that almost every legal experience demonstrates the wisdom of keeping one's own counsel and the fate of the talkative witness who volunteers testimony after his examination is finished was probably not lost upon the presidential candidate he had given his testimony in full his record was open to all who would read it and despite deep provocation and the urging of many friendly advisers he took no part in the fierce campaign which resulted in his election even after the contest was over and he was implored to say something to reassure the seceding south he resisted the temptation to interfere with his predecessor's administration knowing full well that his advice would be disregarded and that it was hopeless to try to save the situation with words alone it reminded him he said of one of his experiences on the circuit when he saw a lawyer making frantic signals to head off an associate who was making blundering admissions to the jury and who continued utterly oblivious to the efforts which were being made to check his ruinous work now that's the way with buchanan and me was his only comment he's given the case away and i can't stop him as the hour for action drew near and lincoln was on the eve of departure for washington he visited his law office to attend to some business matters after all these things were disposed of relates mr herndon he crossed to the opposite side of the room and threw himself down on the old office sofa which after many years of service had been moved against the wall for support he lay there for some moments his face toward the ceiling without either of us speaking he then recalled some incidents of his early practice and took great pleasure in delineating the ludicrous features of many a lawsuit on the circuit then he gathered up a bundle of books and papers he wished to take with him and started to go but before leaving he made the strange request that the signboard which swung on its rusty hinges at the foot of the stairway should remain let it hang there undisturbed he said with a significant lowering of his voice give our clients to understand that the election of a president makes no difference in the firm if i live i'm coming back some time and then we'll go right on practicing law as if nothing had ever happened he lingered for a moment as if to take a last look at the old quarters and then passed into the narrow hallway mr herndon does not state whether or not the sign remained as his partner requested but it was certain that to-day there is nothing to mark or honor any of the office sites in the city of springfield where lincoln the lawyer practiced during almost a quarter of a century End of chapter twenty four chapter twenty five of lincoln the lawyer this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Lincoln the Lawyer by Frederick Trevor Hill. As President. The condition of the government when Lincoln reached Washington may fairly be described as chaotic. Bewildered and intimidated by threats of secession, most of the political leaders in the North had lost their heads and their babble of incoherencies merely aggravated the hopeless confusion during the first weeks of december eighteen sixty at least forty bills each promising national salvation were introduced into the house and senate and more futile propositions were probably never submitted to a legislative body every form of weak need compromise from sentimental sop to abject surrender had its nervous advocate and between andrew johnson's puerile scheme of giving the presidency to the south and the vice presidency to the north and vice versa every alternate four years and daniel sickles wild-eyed pother about new york city separation from the union every phase of political dimension was painfully exhibited 
it was not only the mental weaklings who collapsed under the strain there were men of force and character among the panic-stricken men who bulked big in the national councils and whose reputation as lawyers and jurists stood firmly established but in all the discussions concerning the legality of secession there was no note of authority in the utterances of the union advocates and the stout assertions of the secessionists for the most part passed unchallenged indeed president buchanan who had achieved considerable distinction as a lawyer before his elevation to office employed his legal talents to such poor advantage that he virtually argued against his own client noting prohibitions negations and general impotency in every line of the constitution but not seeing one word of help in it for the government he represented as seward remarked his long and argumentative message to congress in december eighteen sixty conclusively proved first that no state had the right to secede unless it wanted to and second that it was the president's duty to enforce the law unless somebody opposed him but buchanan had the benefit of stanton's distinguished if ineffective advice in the preparation of that very message and seward himself able lawyer though he was completely lost his head a few months later his particular mania taking the suicidal form of averting the civil perils by instigating a foreign war other distinguished members of the bar like like reverend d johnson feeling the ground of precedent slipping beneath their feet stumbled forward shouting vague warnings against illegal steps of any kind and horace greeley almost beside himself with grief and fear quavered out empty suggestions for conciliation which only increased the public perplexity it was in the midst of all this deplorable helplessness and distraction that lincoln assumed his duties as head of the crumbling government and of all the earnest supporters of the union he alone displayed any calmness or presence of mind and his inaugural address contained almost the first decisive utterance on the legal aspect of the situation he was without any national reputation as a lawyer but his opening words were plainly indicative of his professional attainments no state could of its own notion lawfully withdraw from the union he declared with firmness it was not necessary that the constitution should contain any express provision forbidding such action perpetuity was implied if not expressed in the fundamental law of all national governments no government proper ever had a provision in its organic law for its own termination but if the united states was not a government proper but a mere association of states bound by an agreement in the nature of a contract then the law of contracts applied one party to a legal contract might violate it break it so to speak but mutual consent of all parties was necessary before it could be lawfully rescinded such was his simple sane lawyer-like statement of the law so simple indeed that it sounded inadequate to the exigencies of the moment but nothing in all the learned volumes which have since been written on the legal aspects of secession has ever contradicted or disproved it again with quieting firmness he handled the dred scott case the fugitive slave law and the other legal questions in dispute divesting them of all technicalities and disregarding their complicated refinements until he reached the real issues and showed that all the points in controversy could be adjusted by well-recognized principles of law in a word he placed the secessionists for the first time on the defensive appealed to the deep law-abiding sentiment of the american people and afforded the supporters of the union a firm legal foothold he knew the moral effect of a legal authority which the people could understand and the importance of his clear prompt announcement cannot be overestimated but it was when he touched upon the frenzied proposals for compromise that his professional knowledge showed to best advantage he had been repeatedly advised after his nomination to assure the south that he would do nothing to invalidate slavery and when he refused to make any premature announcement of his policy some of the knee-shaking compromisers introduced and passed an amendment in congress to the effect that the federal government should never interfere 
with any domestic institution of the states including that of persons held in slavery those who fathered this amendment firmly believed it would reconcile the south and considered it of vital importance while it met with a storm of denunciation from those who regarded it as an absolute surrender of basic principles but lincoln instantly saw that such a provision was powerless for either good or evil and amounted to nothing more than a reaffirmation of the constitution the federal government had no power under the constitution to interfere with any domestic institution of the states and it was as puerile as it was superfluous to record the fact in a solemnly worded amendment holding such a provision to now be implied constitutional law lincoln coolly remarked of the amendment i have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable this plain calm and gravely humorous exposition of the legal aspects of the situation shows an experienced lawyer well grounded in the fundamental principles of law and it effectually stilled the warring factions in the north by demonstrating the emptiness of their dispute indeed if argument could have averted the impending perils lincoln's initial utterance would have carried the day for no one has ever challenged the findings of fact or overruled the conclusions of law of his first inaugural it is a masterpiece of pleading which alone should entitle him to high rank in the profession a few months after he had given this original proof of professional ability circumstances arose which subjected his legal qualities to a test of almost unparalleled severity and had he not responded the history of this country might not read as it does today shortly after sumter was fired upon but before any serious collision had occurred england and france issued proclamations of neutrality and this practical recognition of the confederacy which aroused public indignation throughout the north provoked seward almost beyond endurance and throwing caution to the wind the great new york lawyer penned a note of instructions to the american minister in london couched in such sharp and peremptory language that its presentation to the british authorities must have instantly resulted in the severance of all diplomatic intercourse but the man to whom the angry secretary submitted his proposed dispatch was a master of self-control schooled by the discipline of the courtroom until he was proof against all provocation in the quiet of his study in its original form it was hot-headed rebuke it left his hands a model of diplomatic remonstrance dignified and firm exhibiting the reserve of a wise counsellor sure of his own cause but offering neither menace nor affront to the parties addressed no layman could possibly have worded that all-important paper with equal skill and it is not too much to say that lincoln's professional caution and astuteness saved a situation fraught with direst national perils certainly his interlineations suggestions and emendations as they appear on seward's manuscript of themselves afford a lesson in legal sagacity and foresight worthy the closest scrutiny of every student of the law the times demanded a lawyer and a lawyer of ability the average practitioner would have been appalled by the situation menacing legal obstacles were interposed to every act of the administration new questions presented themselves for consideration at every turn and a man with a smattering of legal knowledge or no legal knowledge at all might easily have been fretted to impotency by letting i dare not wait upon i would for precedents were wanting and in the many imperious demands of the moment timidity or recklessness spelled equal ruin there was no positive adjudicated authority for calling out the militia to suppress civil insurrection there was no express provision supporting the proclamation of blockade no precedent could be cited for the muster of the three-year volunteers and the power of the executive to increase the regular army and navy was seriously disputed to say nothing of his right to suspend the writ of habeas corpus the conditions were all new but the situation admitted of no delay counsel were not wanting but the ablest of them differed among themselves and every shade of opinion was represented in the discussion of these and kindred questions the extremists free of all responsibility were urgent for prompt action heroic measures 
martial law and every other means legal or illegal to effect their purposes the opposition was untiring in its demands for the judicial interpretation of each letter of the law under such circumstances it naturally followed that every exhibition of caution on the part of the administration was denounced as cowardice and every decisive action was hailed as usurpation true to his training begun in the days when stuart left him to answer his own questions in the dingy springfield office lincoln did his own thinking on the momentous problems which he encountered and he solved them without any attempt to shift responsibility for the result he listened to advice but seldom asked it one of his notable traits as a lawyer and no member of his cabinet ever claimed to have exerted any paramount influence upon his actions but if the times demanded bold fearless decision and firmness they also necessitated argus-eyed caution and shrewdness all the enemies of the union were not in the confederate armies and thousands of sharp cunning plotters in the north watched eagerly for a legal blunder of which they could take advantage while they attempted to intimidate lincoln into inaction by holding before him the direful consequences of a mistake indeed when a bill was introduced into congress in eighteen sixty one to confirm some of his boldest decisions for which there was no positive legal precedent it was bitterly opposed by the exponents of this badgering policy and was passed only after stubborn contest but when at last he was clothed with powers such as few monarchs have ever exercised when the fate of men and the very nation itself often depended upon a stroke of his pen the caution and vigilance born of his long experience at the bar characterized his every action it would be interesting to hear the confessions of the hundreds who called at the white house with the purpose of obtaining his signature to incriminating documents only to have their apparently innocent request granted in such a manner that it defeated their sinister designs almost every line of lincoln's writing from the official document to the scribbles on the little calling cards which he used to answer the thousand and one requests of the visitors who thronged his anteroom day after day shows a master of prudence acquainted with the dangers lurking in every piece of paper and able to guard himself against surprise with apparent unconcern it was a time when great events often hung upon trifles when the effective man was he who could tell whom to trust and whom to suspect and at every crisis and all hours of the day there was a shrewd lawyer in the white house it was lincoln the lawyer as well as the statesman who suggested and urged compensated emancipation upon the slaveholding states and who as counsel for the great cause himself drew the draft of the bill designed for delaware which had it been generally accepted would have saved thousands of lives and millions of treasure it was lincoln the lawyer who against his personal inclinations and the heaviest of moral pressure resisted every effort of the abolitionists to deprive the south of her property rights without due process of law and it was not until every legal remedy had failed that he exercised his authority as military commander and issued the emancipation proclamation it was lincoln the lawyer who fortified by his experience in hundreds of jury trials watched the people to whom a mighty issue was being presented and by anticipating and interpreting their thought guided popular opinion inspired public confidence and at last received the tribute of an unprecedented verdict it was lincoln the lawyer who knowing the crucial point in his cause and keeping it continually in sight remained serenely sane in the babel and pressed steadily forward undiverted and undismayed it was lincoln the lawyer who wrote the state papers which are today recognized as models of finish and form not only in his own country but wherever statecraft is understood and it was lincoln the lawyer whose shrewdness and tact not only saved the nation from foreign complications but paved the way for one of the greatest international lawsuits and most notable diplomatic triumphs the alabama arbitration and award on the eleventh of april eighteen sixty five only four days before his death lincoln spoke of the work still to be completed it was the hour of countless legal questions concerning the status of the seceded states all based upon the inquiry whether they were still in the union or out of it and hot discussions on this delicate point were carrying the disputes 
far afield but lincoln had written that as a peacemaker the lawyer had a superior opportunity of proving himself a good man and true to his own teaching the great advocate waved the quibbling issue aside and passed directly to the heart of the case that question he remarked is bad as the basis of a controversy and good for nothing at all a merely pernicious abstraction we all agree that the seceded states so called are out of their proper relation to the union and that the sole object of the government civil and military in regard to those states is to again get them into that proper relation finding themselves safely at home it would be utterly immaterial whether they had ever been abroad let us all join in doing the acts necessary to restoring the proper practical relations between these states and the union and each forever after innocently indulge his own opinion whether in doing the acts he brought the states from without into the union or only gave them proper assistance they never having been out of it reading these words who can doubt that it would have been lincoln the lawyer who would have proved the genius of reconstruction had he been allowed to live and help bind up the nation's wounds in the oak ridge cemetery at springfield an imposing pile of masonry marks the spot where lincoln lies it is embellished with mighty groups in bronze representing the glamour and heroics of war soldiers and sailors dying and dealing out death pain horror defiance and rage depicted on their faces but among all the symbols of valiant dust one looks in vain for some recognition of the lawyer jurist and statesman whose whole life work was an appeal to men's reason and the highest motives of humanity whose only weapons were argument and persuasion and who ever invoked justice and never the god of battles for the triumph of his cause end of chapter twenty five end of lincoln the lawyer by frederick trevor hill